The Last Winding, written and produced by Richard Good. W. H. Wade, F. Heritage, C. Pillin, D. R. N. S. H. C. F. H. A. Calvert, W. J. Billing. B. Every Brooks, week, twice a week, Billing, I would Rock climb Rock, these steps, Allen, climbing starward to where the prayers of old Rangers. ring with bat song and the fire of tested faith. Owl high, the sky's hinterland. The first landing is where the bell ringers meet. It's light and neat here, carpeted and ordered, as befits a community that flows to the patterns of numbers and figured diagrams and shouted ring calls. But we need to go higher still, up two more sets of ladders that lean lazily against stone, each step grooved and smoothed by the boot treads of a hundred years or more. As you climb, they creak and flex like the masts of an anchored schooner. This too is fitting, for we are climbing haphazard-like to heaven, a place caught between two worlds and therefore elemental and raw, where the wind sometimes booms, and when it rains it is beautiful, and you can see sun rising like a green cresting wave through the dimmed cataract-misted eyes of its southward window, and on weekdays the children's voices from the playground below float upwards like the songs of gulls. And you know that, in some way, you are now no longer grounded upon the earth. Three or four steps before you get to the top of the final ladder, you must push up the trap door so that it drops heavily back against the backstop, and you have arrived. For most, this is a liminal transitory place. Few come here, fewer stop. This is the clockwinder's landing, crisscrossed with rods, wires and ropes, cluttered with the detritus from below, butterfly wings jewel the cobwebs. This is where flies winter in the glistening black clusters, the holy pigeons doze among the prayers of our weathered saints, and dust motes swim the shallow river of daylight. The pulse beat of time fills this place. Everything here is functional, and because of it, it has that special pure beauty. Made by Smiths of Derby, who still maintain it, in 1877, the flatbed motion, cast in iron and alchemy and brass, time sculpted in its geometric forms, ticks and spins and whirls and chimes the slow journeys of the sun and moon across Tyso's sky. Upon this oiled loom, the village's seconds and minutes and even centuries have been woven. Three trains with three weights heavy with time that each week make their slow incremental descent down the tower, second by second, minute by minute, lowering time from the almost heavens to the village below. Three trains, the chime, going, the strike, that must be hauled by hand back up the tower. It seems right that we pay for our allotment of time with our sinew and sweat. Between the hour and quarter chime, 14 minutes to wind, at first it was a challenge and I often needed to stop while the first quarter tripped and rang out, and then to continue. Later it was easier. It was always a joy when I finished, hanging the winding handle upon its hook and sitting on the steps by the little door that is St Mary's eye to watch the action whir and listen to the bells play out as the tune barrel slowly turned. Three winds of the windlass for every complete rotation of the weight pulley, smoothly so as not to snatch, taking the weight in stomach and arms. This way, the buttery way of time is churned. The soft purr of the ratchets counterpoint to the steady clunk of the going. Always steady, always careful lest the ratchet slip, sending the weight tumbling to the ground, time literally flying through your hands. Count out each turn in sections of hundred. Slowly the weight rises. Thirty more, and it will be visible through the hatch. Another forty will see it to the top. First the chime, 
then the going. This winds the clock. The weight is much smaller and it allows breath to return to the body and strength to the arms. Then, finally, the strike. Always breathless at the end. Time ebbs and flows with the seasons. The pendulum contracts with the cold and time speeds up. Summer, time can be as slow and as languorous as the dog days of August. Reset village time. Stop the pendulum to capture lost minutes. If too slow, turn the setting dial to nudge the great hands forward, slowing down, speeding up the uncounted minutes, regulating Dylan's God-speeded time. If there were any moments in my life that could be described thus, it was then. These were hallowed times. A place where the streams of time elided, stood still, slipped back. A confluence of present and past that became the breathed promise of the future. For 142 years, this clock has regulated and sung out with four of its six bells, village time. It has marked the lives and now forgotten moments of all who have lived here. And for 139 years, men and women have climbed these steps, breathed this musty pigeon-hallowed air to give life to their next weeks and their unknown triumphs and sorrows. For 139 years, each winder gave to the village each quarter hour that tumbled over thatch and tile, rolling down the nestling streets, its buildings the colour of dripping honey lit by a gathering sun, the tune of each quarter lifting and kicking over the tucked fields, ridged by the brute muscle of those who have lived before us. And I am not the only one to have felt this. The side of the clock cabinet bears the marks made by those who came before me. Penciled names and dates, fragmentary ephemeral records, graffiti, epigraphy from older worlds that give voice to their present, our shared community C. history. D-R-N-S H-C-F-H A. Calvert W. J. Billing B. Wilkes, W. R. Billing, John Rycroft, Sean Allen, Danny Packman, David Burton, and now, for a short while, me. There are not as many inscriptions here as those on the lintels of the landing below where the bell ringers meet. Clockwinders' duties are more solitary and, perhaps because of it, attract the more introverted, less gregarious. Clockwinders are more raven than rook each inscription marking the contours of our lives for our own to see. Joseph O. Phillips, August 1894, 15 Market Street, A. Bank. Smith, 10th of October, Girl, Baby. F. Heritage Clockwinder, 1917 to 1918, expired February the 9th, February the 19th. Quiet triumphs, quiet celebrations and remembrance, but no less insignificant for that each name carrying on the duties of the one before, each knowing the deliberate, unhurried clunk of the clock mechanism, the whirl of the ratchets tripping over the toothed wheels, the dusty smell of summer stonework and the sharp must of the masonry rhymed in ice, the burn in the arms and chest, the play of light and wind, the smoothness of the winding handle that feels as if our predecessors have only just put it down. And these ghosted figures form the clouds of witnesses that compassed me about, and I keenly felt their presence, their appraising eyes at my laboured breathing, my misjudged winding when the handle slipped, or the cogs jammed, and my oily, bloodied fingers as I struggled to loose them. An autumn and a winter, caring for the clock, drenched by summer rain, wading calf-deep the fields through snowy fields, and slowly the voices thawed, and I began to feel more accepted, no longer the soft-handed outsider with clothes stained by city dust, and we shared a companionable silence. I have no idea which times they chose to do their winding. I have a photograph of Francis Heritage, fresh-faced, powerful, casually leaning against his brand-new bread-delivery van, full of the nonchalance of youth. I can imagine him cutting across the main street from the shop, 
diligently winding in silence, the clicking of ratchets, the slow pull of the weight, the dance of dust in the pale beams of sunshine. He must have loved these times as much as I did. F heritage. Good old, Good old clock. clock, he wrote on the ladder where I, and perhaps he, hung our dripping coats. F heritage wound this clock in the year 1917 to 18. And I know why he felt the need to write this, why we all felt this need to leave in some way a tangible mark of love and pride for the eyes of only those who would understand to see. Seven sweeps of the hand around the four convex faces, north, east, south, west, between each wind. Eighty-four hours allotted to the village by the winder's arm and the god that has given it strength, the choir gifts the village with its vocabulary of song, the bell ringers with their peals of coded messages, birth, marriage, death, war, prayer, celebration, service and grief. The vicar addresses the cankered heart and the skull beneath the skin and the gift of the clockwinder. They gave to the village the precious burden that is the awareness of time. In 2015 it was decided that the clock was to be automated and I was informed that the duties of a clock winder was no longer needed. On the 19th of May 2015 the clock of St Mary's Tyso was wound by hand for the last time. W. H. Wade, Kyneton 1914, F. Heritage 1917 to 1918. C. Pillin, February 1918 to 1919. D. R. Army, N. S. Army, H. C. Army. F. H. A. Calvert, 1947 to 1958. W. J. Billing, 1960 to 1970. B. Wilkes, 1970 to 1972. W. R. Billing, Tyson. John Rycroft, 1973 to 1981. Sean Allen, 1973 to 1981. Danny Packman, PC 122, May 1981 to February 1987. David Burton, March 1987. To March 2012. Richard Good, April 2012 to May 2015. Finis.